Hello, everyone. Happy Easter. Welcome to Word of Life Church. It is a great day to be together in the house of God with the people of God, in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a great joy to join together today in worship. Welcome to everybody here in the room. Welcome to those of you joining us online. We're gonna celebrate the resurrection today. We'll come to the table, we'll sing together. In just a moment, we're gonna sing a song that is based off of an ancient Christian hymn, something that the church has been singing for centuries. Based on this line, Christ is risen from the graves, trampled over death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Let's receive that resurrection life today. Would you stand together with us? Let us pray this confession of worship. We have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We have come to this moment to worship God. We have come to confess that Jesus is Lord. We are not here to be entertained. We are here to encounter the sacred. We are not consumers, we are worshipers. We praise and adore the living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Oh, uh-huh. 
A reading from the Gospel of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we, who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection, may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. There was a moment when the lights went out Death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens rose
eternity The king of life was on the moon and Lord of Lords. Amen. He is the one who is dead but is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We sang songs this morning and Christians have been singing songs for thousands of years of the glory of Christ. One of the oldest songs that we have is called the Christ Hymn, Philippians chapter 2. And this song was inspired no doubt by these words. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can we give him glory this morning? Praise and honor that is due his name. If Christ is risen from the dead, then death has been defeated and all shall be well. Amen. Today is a day of good news. Today is a day of celebration, of joy, of hope. Though morning may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. So if you came to this place this morning with tears in life, if you came with with a heaviness, if you came with that dark cloud of Good Friday, I want to say to you that since Christ is risen, all things shall be well. And so if you came with those tears, I pray this morning that you would be given for those tears a song of praise, that for those ashes, you would be given beauty this morning. For that despair, you would be given hope. I believe that's gonna happen this morning in the presence of the risen King, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen and amen. Well, it's so good to worship with you here in the house of the Lord this morning. Would you greet someone around you and say he is risen this morning as you take your seat? If you're new at Word of Life Church and you're our guest this morning, I just want to say a special welcome to you and happy Easter. My name is Pastor Jacob. I'm one of the, well, my name is Jacob. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're joining us online for the first time, um, we're really glad that you've tuned in on this Easter Sunday as well. We would love to connect with you here at Word of Life if you are new this week uh, following our Easter service. And the way that we can know that you are here with us and reach out to you later this week is if you could fill out the connect form. Um, there's some actual paper forms in the pew back in front of you, or you can see there's a QR code there in the pew back. If you just scan that code, you can go to the electronic um, web-based form, fill that out. If you're joining us online and you're a guest, we also have an online form for you as well. We would love to connect with you as well. We have such a, an incredible, vibrant, thriving online congregation that tunes in from all over the world. And uh, I'm just so blessed to see all of you Word of Lifers online caring for one another and being the body of Christ uh, there online in that digital space. We've, we've had some online members that have been going through some hard times in life, some seasons of struggle, and it was just beautiful to watch our online congregation just become the hands and feet of Jesus and the presence of Jesus for one another. So we're really glad that our onliners are joining us today. Amen. Well, I have a couple of uh, announcements, but before we get to announcements, we're going to continue in worship this morning through giving. And if you're our guest this morning, what we ask of you is to contribute by giving us that Connect card in the offering. If you fill it out, this is your time to put that in the offering bucket. But I just want to say to Word of Lifers, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. That, that Christ has been victorious and Christ will be victorious. And part of the victory of Christ is won through the church being the presence of Jesus in the world, bringing about the victory of Christ in everyday moments, fighting back the darkness in the world and bringing about love and kindness and mercy. And so I just wanna say, well done, good and faithful servants by participating every week in your faithfulness and giving. Uh, it's, It's a participation in what the church is doing to proclaim the good news of the risen Christ in the world, amen? And so this morning as we give, I want to invite you just to give an Easter offering because Christ is risen from the dead. Let us all participate in what Jesus is doing in and through his church to to see, see that victory come to pass in the world that we live in. So I invite you to do that this morning. Uh, There's all kinds of ways to give. You can have some fun and text to give. I give you permission. Go ahead and text in church. It's all good. Uh, It's not, you know, eighth grade anymore. You won't get in trouble. Don't worry. Um, You can text in church. We also have an online portal for giving, or you can use those envelopes in the pew back in front of you. Amen. Well, as we prepare our offering this morning, would you join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. While the offering passes your way, I'd like to make you aware of a couple of announcements. We've got some ways for you to get connected at Word of Life happening during this Easter season. Starting this Wednesday, we have a couple of new groups that are launching. First, I want to let you know about Faith Foundations. That's an eight-week Theology 101, the, the foundations of our faith. So if you're curious about the Christian faith or you just feel like you want to get back to the basics and kind of cover the fundamentals, this is a great way for you to do that, plus connect with some other people here at the church. We're going to be meeting on Wednesday evenings starting this Wednesday, and Pastor Brian, Perry, and Pastor Derek are going to be teaching different sessions of that course. You can learn more about that on our website. You can just scan that QR code in front of you and uh, go to the events page on our website and learn more about Faith Foundations. You can sign up there or you can sign up in the foyer to let us know that you're coming. We also are going to launch in the afternoon on Wednesdays, not just 6.30 in the evening will be Faith Foundations. At 1 p.m. in the afternoon, we're going to do an Easter Bible study. Pastor Derek Vreeland, our discipleship pastor, will be leading us through an Easter Bible study on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. in the Life Center. So here's, here's what you could do on Wednesdays. You could join us at noon. We have a prayer and communion service us in the upper room, then you can stay and hang out and go to the Bible study at one. I know a lot of you have done that and it's been uh, really enriching on Wednesday. So if you're available, we'd love for you to join us for that. And then ladies, we uh, have a ladies afternoon tea scheduled for April 13th in the Life Center from two o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. And if you'd like to connect and build some relationships with some of the other ladies at the church, this is an excellent opportunity for you to do that. You can sign up in the foyer or online as well at our events page. And then summer, did you know summer is just around the corner? Spring break has just happened. Students are itching for warm, I know that I'm itching for warm weather, but uh, students are ready to get out of school and have summertime. So we are preparing as a church to do all of those ministry things we do for families through the summer, uh, most notably VBS and youth camp. So VBS is for our four-year-olds through fifth graders at Word of Life Church. It's July 15th through 18th. And we transform this place, the church, into like this immersive experience for kids. It's like Disneyland in St. Joe. Uh, we kind of go all out. We try to make it just a week that they talk about all year long. I have a couple little ones that they wear their VBS shirts all year long and talk about VBS. So if you have little ones in your life, we would love to invite you for them, invite you to have them participate in Vacation Bible School this year, July 15th to 18th. You can learn more on our website, wolc.com slash VBS. And then if you have students, teenagers in your life, upcoming sixth graders through graduating 12th graders, we are headed to Estes Park, Colorado, to the Rocky Mountains for an unforgettable week of youth camp in the presence of Christ in the mountains. We really do work to create opportunities for students to have significant life-changing moments in the presence of Jesus at our summer camp. So if you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to wolc.com for slash camp. All right, before we get to the sermon this morning, we have prepared a couple of videos to give you a glimpse of all of those fun events for our kids and students at Word of Life this summer, so check these out. Ooh, it's another hot one out there. Temps reaching over 100 degrees today. Hope you're keeping cool and having fun on this hot summer day. Now, let's get back.
Yeah. Yeah, those are, that's like, that's like the preview of coming attractions. That's, that's great stuff. So let's get the kids to VBS. Let's get the teens out to Estes Park for camp. It's all good stuff. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Christ has risen from the dead. Everything's going to be all right. Onliners, happy Easter to you. It's good to have you with us. Well, it's, it's that long journey through Lent. We've been, we've been traveling through that, that time where it's kind of dark. It's kind of minor key. It's kind of uh, we're moving towards death. And during Lent, we've been looking at the cross as the wood between the worlds. There is the world that was and the world to come. And between those two worlds is the wood upon which the Son of God was hung. But we've completed the journey through Lent. And now we've arrived at Easter. And today, on Easter, I want us to look at the cross as the center that holds. St. Paul is the apostle of the resurrection. By that I mean, I mean all of the apostles proclaim the resurrection, but Paul's the one that gives us the most robust theology of resurrection. What does it mean? Is it, you know, it's not just a happy ending to the story. They nailed him to the cross, they put him in the ground, they should have known you can't keep a good man down. I mean, it's more than that. It, it's, and Paul is the one tasked by the Holy Spirit to bring us the glorious theology of resurrection. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, the apostle Paul writes, in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Let's start with, um, let's start with a poet. Let's start with William Butler Yeats. He was a, for sure, he was a poet seer. He is, in my mind, the greatest of all Irish poets, and that's saying a lot because you know how the Irish are with their poets. They have so many of them. Uh, W.B. Yeats was born near Dublin in 1865. He started writing poetry at age 17. In 1923, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. His most famous poem is The Second Coming. He wrote that in 1919 in the aftermath of World War I. The poem opens like this. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. Yeah, he wrote this in the wake of World War I. And the poem explores a world coming undone under the pressure of modern mechanized warfare. The poet says things fall apart. The center cannot hold. And then the poem describes a world spinning out of control in an ever-expanding vortex of violence, a a, a tornado that's growing bigger and bigger and sweeping across the whole world. He says, turning and turning in the widening gyre. And then the poem laments that humanity seemingly can no longer hear God. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Hmm. The poem then yearns, this is where it gets its title, the the poem yearns for the hope of the second coming of Christ. But the poem fears that instead there will be a second coming of world war. He wrote this in 1919 at the end of World War I. He's hoping, you know, for the second coming of Christ, but afraid that what we're going to get is the second coming of a world war. He really was a a poet seer. It laments that humanity uh, cannot escape this vortex and it fears that 
yet another war is going to come. And Yeats then imagines a second war. This is before it happens, but he imagines it as, as the Sphinx, you know, in, the Egypt, in Egypt, the Sphinx coming to life as a pitiless monster that threatens the whole world. And the poem ends like this. The darkness drops again, but now I know. The 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Yeats, the poet, becomes Yeats, the prophet. You've heard me say for years, the poet, the poetic, and the prophetic are related. And Yeats really becomes a prophet when he intuits that a beast is about to be born, not actually in Bethlehem, but in Berlin. That's what he's talking about. He, he, I don't know how much he foresaw, but he says there, there is a, a hideous beast that is slouching towards his own Bethlehem to be born. Um, and yet, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. W.B. Yeats was, by no means, he wasn't always... Uh, grim. I mean, he, he foresaw this, but he wasn't always grim by any means. In his poem, The Magi, Yeats describes Christ born in Bethlehem as the uncontrollable mystery on the bestial floor. God, I love that. The uncontrollable mystery born, you know, Jesus was born in the stable and where they kept the beasts. He describes Christ as the uncontrollable mystery born on the bestial floor. The uncontrollable mystery. What a great title for Christ. I think the Apostle Paul would go, dang, that's good. I like that one. Wish I would have used that one. I mean, I should should do a sermon. I think I will. I'm I'm deciding right now. I don't know what it's going to be, but I need to do a sermon just called The Uncontrollable Mystery. Might be my next one. Who knows? I should probably write a book called The Uncontrollable Mystery. That's a great title right there. All the good titles come from poets, so I have to think about that. So that's, that's Yeats who sets it up for us. I'm talking about a center that cannot hold. But uh, now let's turn to the Apostle Paul. Who, by the way, by the way, was much more of a poet than he's given credit for. I mean, when he wasn't tasked with having to do the nitty gritty pastoral work of telling Corinthians not to get drunk at the Lord's Supper and stop suing one another, he could actually be very poetic. He should be given more credit as a poet. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I've become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Oh, come on now. That's as good as any sonnet by Shakespeare. And it's just as famous. That's Paul in his ode to love. And then we could look at Romans chapter 8, which is very very poetic. There's the great hymn to the cross that, that Jacob was riffing on there at the end of worship. He's given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, earth, and hell, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And everybody cheer. I mean, he could, he could be a great poet. And he's at his best. Paul is at his best when he leans into what I call theopoetics, doing theology through the poetic. And he does this oftentimes in his Christological poems that we find in Ephesians and in Colossians. And that's what I want to do now. I want to go to Colossians. I just gave you a little snippet there to begin with, but I want to give you the whole poem. Now, now Paul did not give a title to this poem. Uh, I'm a big one on titles. <laughs> I can't write a sermon or a book until I have the, I start with the title. The title for me provides the telos. This is where it's going to go. And since Paul did not give a title to this poem in Colossians chapter one, I will give it a title. And I'm going to call it the Christ of all things. And you'll notice that six times in this theopoetics from the Apostle Paul, you'll hear the phrase all things. Each time you hear it, it's significant. So here's what the Apostle Paul writes about in the Christ of all things. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. 
in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he may come to have first place in all things. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or in whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. I mean, how beautiful is that? In this scant eight verses, is an eight verse long poem, Paul gives us no less than a dozen Christological diamonds. I'll just point them out. I'm not, believe me, I'm not preaching a 12 point sermon on Easter Sunday, so just relax. But I just want to point them out, what he's, what he's hitting at. He's, he's, he's bringing these things out, that Christ is the fullness of God. That's the first thing. That Christ is the image of the invisible God. We don't know what God's like. I talked about this on Good Friday. People don't know what God is like, so they project upon God their own fears, their own anger, their own lust for retribution, their own violence, and they imagine God in in the most horrific ways oftentimes. But Paul says that Christ is the image, the icon. At last we know what God looks like. God is like Jesus. Come on, I might as well do it Easter Sunday. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been a time when God wasn't like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. do. Yes. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Christ is the creator of all things. Did you know this? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him. And apart from him, nothing was made that was made. Christ is the firstborn over all creation. Christ is the firstborn from the dead. Happy Easter. Christ is before all things. Christ is the one from whom, Christ is the one for whom are all things. Oh, wait, wait. Christ is the creator of all things, and all things are for Christ. All things find their telos, their purpose, their goal, their ultimate end in Christ. They come forth from Christ and ultimately attain Christ. All things are created for Christ. Lately, I've been doing a lot of interviews and I've talked to some various people and they say something to me that I really take as a deep compliment. And I've I've started noticing, well, people that would say that about me. And they say, you know, BZ, when I hear you talk, it gives me hope. when, When you talk or when you write, it gives me hope. It's a hopeful message. And then they ask me, this, this happened at breakfast. In fact, I met with a young man yesterday and he said, he said, when I hear you preach, when I read what you write, you give me hope. What is your hope? <laughs> I mean, are you just putting a brave face on it? Are you just whistling past the graveyard? No, no. I'm not a naive optimist looking at the world through rose tinted glasses, pretending I don't see what I see. I see it all. I know, I know the mess we're in. I know the horrors that are out there. But what I believe is this, that all things are created for Christ and that Christ does not create and then abandon his creation and leave it in a wreck and a ruin. I know we have to pass through things 
and that's awful, and Christ is with us in solidarity and suffering, but that's not even, even that's not the end of the story, that we are moving towards a time when all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. I actually believe this. I actually believe that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. That's where my hope comes from. I, bu- I can't get off this one. I, I believe what Paul says. He is, he's the apostle of resurrection. He says that everything's moving towards this end. He uses that word, the telos, towards this telos, that God will be all in all. Through Christ, through what Christ, bringing all things to himself, that, that 1 Corinthians 15, 28, that God shall be all in all. Theos, pas, and pas. That's where my hope comes from. Christ has first place in all things. Christ has redeemed and forgiven us. Amen. Christ is the head of the church. Christ has reconciled all things to himself. That's a similar sentiment. That's where we get that that glorious theology of apocatastasis. Apocatastasis. Acts 3.21, that the apostle Peter says, well, in the end, there's going to be a universal restoration That in Christ, God is going to reconcile all things. All things. And then finally, Christ holds all things together. That's the one I want to spend a few more minutes on. Christ holds all things together. Now, in his own way, the great Irish poet W.B. Yeats, um, his, his poem, The Second Coming, is truly prophetic. It was, I mean, it was true. It came to pass. I mean, World War I wasn't the end, war to end all wars. It wasn't the Great War. It was the Great War until the next one came. There, there was a monstrous beast slouching towards his own Bethlehem to be born that would bring even greater horrors upon the world. Um, and Yeats saw, you know, he, the Bethlehem in which it was born was not Bethlehem, actually. It was Berlin. But that's what he's, that's what the, that's what the, Poet prophet is intuiting that there's another one coming, slouching towards poetically it's Bethlehem, but literally it's Berlin. Yeats saw the beast of Berlin as clearly as John the Revelator saw the beast of Rome. They're both they're both prophets. And I see the rough beast. I you know, I am not naive. I do know what's going on in the world. I know about the, the rough beasts slouching toward Ukraine, slouching toward southern Israel, slouching into Gaza. I know about all these rough beasts. I'm fully aware of it. But as Yates says, there's also the uncontrollable mystery that condescends to be born on the bestial floor. And this is what the Paul, this is what the apostle Paul is reaching for in his glorious Christ of all things poem. So what I'm saying is on this Easter Sunday is we can be clear eyed realists about the centers that do not hold, but at the same time have a transcendent hope. Everybody say hope. That's the warrior emotion. Have a transcendent hope because of the one who through his cross holds all things together. That's where my hope comes from. That a Christ through his cross and resurrection holds all things together. In some ways though, a picture is worth a bunch of sermons. So that's, that's how the saying goes. And so we've brought back this resurrection icon by Ivanka Demchuk, Ukrainian modern iconographer in Lviv. She calls this resurrection. It's, it's a take on the ancient Byzantine Anastasis resurrection icon. It has the same theological values, but it's done in a more modern style. And so what we have is we have Christ descending into the realm of the dead. The cross is present. These these are the gates of hell. I don't know if you can see this. The gates of hell that have fallen in the form of a cross beneath the feet of Christ. He's trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. So the cross becomes the point at which the Son of God enters into death. 
He descends into the realm of the dead. There's broken chains and locks and keys, all of that falling beneath the cross of Christ. And now he's reaching forth and he's grabbing a hold of this man called Adam, this woman called Heva, Adam and Eve, humankind, and pulling them up, pulling them up out of their graves and bringing them uh, into, into newness of life. And the apostle Paul describes this event like this in Ephesians 4. And he's riffing off another poem that we know of as Psalm 68. And he says that Christ, we, before he ascended into heaven, he first descended into the lower parts of the, of the earth, into Sheol, into Hades, into hell, into death. And he made captivity captive. So you, so you have the whole human race represented by these figures that are held captive in death. They, they become the captives of death. Christ descends into death, but he is not a captive. He dies because Jesus is fully human and as a mortal, he can die. And so Jesus de descends into death like every mortal, but he's not like every mortal because he's also fully God. And when Christ descended into death, he did not descend as a captive, but as a conqueror. And he, de he descends and Christ announces the death. Death, all the captives that were your captives, guess what? They're my captives now. And I'm going to take them forth into liberty, into freedom, into salvation, into life. And so this is how, this is how the early church both preached and sang about what Christ accomplishes in his death, burial, and resurrection. There's a, I mean, they just loved it. And one of the, one of the things they did frequently was to, they would compose sermons and songs where death itself was given a voice. Hell itself was allowed to speak and and talk about what terror and what horror it is experiencing as Christ comes. And one of them, I'm going to share one of them with you. This is from uh, St. Basil the, uh, of Caesarea. This comes from the 300s. So it's a very early Christian Easter hymn. This is the kind of Easter hymns they had. And I got to tell you, it, it's like, it's totally metal. <laughs> I mean, Metallica, just take, the lyrics of Basil the Great, you know, and just add some heavy riffs and it's perfect. So it goes like this. Today, hell groans and cries aloud. My power has been, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do the, the metal monster voice, but you can imagine. Today, hell groans and cries aloud. My power has been destroyed. I accepted a mortal man as one of the dead, yet I cannot keep him prisoner. And with him, I shall lose all those whom I ruled. I held in my power the dead from all ages, but see, he has raised them all. <laughs> Glory to your cross, O Lord, and to your resurrection. Notice how, how the hymn connects cross and resurrection in one central event. The cross and the resurrection become one thing, not as a personal victory of Jesus over death, but that he might liberate all of humanity from the captivity of death. And so Ivanka Demchuk, she's, she's done great with this. So if you really look with a bit of theological insight, and someday I hope to meet her and ask her, did you know you were doing this or was it just the Holy Spirit swept you up? But what she's done is she's depicted Christ traversing three worlds. There's the dark world of death where humanity has been held captive. And Jesus now is stepping upon the tawny rim of the earth. The, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But behind Christ and where he's leading humanity as he brings them forth is into the deep blue heavens of God's eternity. And so we have Christ, the eternal world, stepping onto the tawny rim of human enfleshment and then goes all the way down into the dark world of death that he might find humanity and bring them out and bring them into God's glorious heaven. All that in a painting. 
Hmm. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. That's what the, the Apostle Paul says. All right. In him all things hold together. That's what I, that's, that's what I see. In him, he's, th- things could, the ultimate dissolution is death. And things ultimately fall apart in death. In Adam all fall apart. All die. But Christ comes and says, no, no, no. I'm not going to lose it. I'm the creator of all things and all things are created for me. I'm going to take hold of you and I'm going to take hold of you. I got you. And I'm going to hold it all together. In him, all things hold together. So let's, we, we, we've been on the heights of Christological theology, the mighty peaks. Let's come down a little bit lower just for a few moments. Come down into the, into the, the warm terrain of more at sea level. Our lives, as we're living our lives, our lives need an organizing center with enough spiritual gravity so we can keep it together. Family and friends, careers and causes, hobbies and interests, these are all good things that pertain to our common humanity. But in and of themselves, in and of themselves, family and friends and hobbies and interests and causes and careers lack sufficient spiritual gravity to keep us properly centered. The the only thing that can be at the organizing center of our life and really hold everything together is Christ. Anything else put at the center, even family, even friends, certainly Causes and careers and hobbies. and Anything that is put there in the organizing center other than Christ becomes an idol. And you know what idols always do? They always fall apart. And when your idol falls apart, so do you. Christ alone is qualified to occupy the sacred center that holds all of life together. So, Jesus Christ is the uncontrollable mystery born on the bestial floor of Bethlehem's stable that the creator might enter creation. Creator entering creation. In youth and young manhood, the creator became a carpenter, working rough-hewn timber with calloused hands. On Good Friday, the calloused hands of the creator carpenter were nailed to rough-hewn timber, and the tree of Calvary became the center of the cosmos, the center that holds the center that heals, the center that inaugurates the world to come. The tree of Calvary is the wood between the worlds. Three trillion trees, and one became the wood between the worlds. God died upon a tree that by God's own death, a door might be opened to the world on the far side of the wood. This world is a womb, a womb for the world to come. This is a chrysalis cosmos still cocooned, awaiting metamorphosis. I once caught a glimpse of the new world unfurled. I had a dream. I dreamed I was in a big and beautiful city. I think it may have been Barcelona. The cityscape spread before my eyes. I saw tall buildings and wide boulevards. I saw shops and restaurants. I saw people sitting in parks and strolling along sidewalks. It was good, and it all seemed very real. Then there were sirens. In the Bible, it's trumpets, but in my dream, it was sirens. Loud sirens. Everyone knew what the sirens meant. It was kingdom come. Some were exultant. Some were afraid. But whether happy or frightened, it was kingdom come for each and every one. And as I looked, the cityscape before my eyes, which had seemed so real, so substantial, began to flutter. And then it began to tear, as if it were made of mere fabric. And as the fabric of the cityscape began to tear away, there appeared a new city, a new Barcelona, if you will. The new city was not entirely different, for there was a continuity with the old city. 
But the new city was far more glorious, far more dazzling, far more beautiful, and far more substantial. For here we have no enduring city, but there is an eternal city to come. I saw the holy city coming down from heaven, adorned as a bride for her husband. That heavenly city, which is to come, is the world on the far side of the wood. Three trillion trees. They came to be on the third day of creation. That double blessed day of verdant goodness. Three trillion trees. One became the wood upon which the Son of God was hung. A tree created on the third day, the third day, the day of three trillion trees. And on the third day of new creation, the stone was rolled away. On the third day, the gardener walked again in the garden. On the third day, the firstborn emerged from a cocoon called death. On the third day, a new world was born. There is the world that was and the world to come. And between those two worlds is the wood upon which the Son of God was hung. Three trillion trees, one became the wood between the worlds. Stand up with me. And now, and now, we come to the bread of heaven. We come to the gift of life that Christ gives us in his body and in his blood. That's the mystery of the holy sacrament. That through the bread and the cup, we participate in the life-giving flesh and blood of Christ. In just a moment, we'll confess our faith, confess our sins, and then you'll be invited to come. And everyone, 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 everyone is invited. And as you come, the ushers will direct you to where people are serving communion. You'll come and someone will have a basket of bread and they'll say, the body of Christ broken for you. Amen. Take a piece of that bread. Standing next to them will be someone with a cup. And they'll say, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Take the bread, dip it in the cup, and receive the gift of God in Christ. Join with me now, first of all, in confessing our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let's confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. Because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.
I cast my mind to Calvary when Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the
be to God. I hope your hearts are filled with joy today. Do I believe that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead? Oh, with all my heart, with all my heart. And it's what I live my life on. It's where the source of, of the joy of my life that keeps me going, it, it's where it comes from. So we're glad that you've been here to worship with us today. Do you know that every Sunday is a little Easter? Every Sunday is a little Easter. And so if you don't have a, a church home, we invite you to come back and join us. Um, if you need prayer, if you need somebody to join hands with you and pray for a specific need, there'll be people down here at the front at the end of the service. As soon as we dismiss, just come right on down and somebody will pray with you about whatever you need. If you're new here, there's a kiosk out in the foyer, a welcome kiosk, and we'd like you to go by and introduce yourself and uh, get a free gift. Getting ready to have an Easter egg hunt. Amen. And the instructions are to go get your kids and um, go out the back door, and Brian is going to announce yeah, what time okay, it'll start. So, so here's how, to, here, first of all, what a great day in the house of the Lord. Yes, yes. What a great day in the house of the Lord. Amen. And I have been tasked is very important with assigning the time that the Easter egg hunt will begin. It will begin, I'm going to give you a little, it will begin precisely, you know, I'm Swiss and I'm big about all this, at 11 or 1235, 1235, that's... No, wait, 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 1135. Oh, whatever time. I mean, I mean, on, on, on the East Coast. Right, it's, it's the minute hand that counts. I, I don't know what time. I thought I preached for two hours. I didn't preach for, okay. Yeah, so 11. <laughs> it's the 35 that counts. So that'll give you plenty of time to, uh, well, you don't have to run out. You know, it's, it's, it's that little driveway, you know, out there on the northwest part of our property. That's where we have an Easter egg hunt for kids fifth grade and younger, fifth grade and younger, but you don't have to rush out there now. So you need to get your kids, you know, if they're in the nurseries or wherever they are, but you have time to hang out, fellowship, give people high fives because Jesus was risen from the dead, you know, all of that. Uh, but at 1135, I don't know, we have a siren. I was, I was reading a poem about sirens. The sirens go off or something like that happens. No, no. Uh, no. 1135. Yeah. Sirens go off. And the Easter egg hunt begins. Yes, something like that. I think it's sirens. I don't know. We'll find out. Maybe it's trumpets. Who knows? <laughs> All right. So, so that, that's gonna, it, we'll, we'll, we'll end with. Why do we do an Easter egg hunt? Because I want in the I want in childhood children to be able to associate Easter and the celebration of the resurrection with things like fun and joy and hope. And we want to create those memories. Amen. That matters. That kind of stuff matters. All right. I'm going to speak this blessing upon you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you the peace that comes from knowing that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead and everything's going to be all right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you. Go in peace.